A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast in which I talk to artists about their influences from the worlds of film, music and of course art and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, Mike Nelson, one of the most significant British sculptors and installation artists of this century. Mike has spent the past three decades assembling materials gathered in junkyards, flea markets, online auctions, even street corner fly tips into often labyrinthine sculptural environments. He creates distinctive spaces that suggest fictional and often science fictional narratives, while alluding to diverse histories, obscure countercultural or political movements and current affairs, as well as his own biography. They're dense, absorbing, atmospheric and often claustrophobic, complete experiences in themselves. Mike Nelson was born in 1967 in Loughborough in the UK and lives and works in London. He studied first at Reading University and then at Chelsea College of Art and Design in London. Within months of graduating in 1994, he was showing ambitious environments, including, as you'll hear, at the influential artist-run space transmission in Glasgow. In this early period, he developed the idea of the hybrid script, a conceptual framework that arguably has guided his work ever since, which Mike has described as a mixture of a real political event a reference to the site of the work and a reference to a fictional other. By 1996, Mike had made trading station Alpha CMA, which took the hybrid script to a new level, moving from a sculptural or assemblage object into a total environment. Trading station Alpha CMA effectively turned Matt's gallery in London into a warehouse filled with objects and materials that hinted at diverse narratives from geopolitical incidents to particular works of film and literature and suggested human presence, yet defied exact interpretation. Mike continued to develop even more complex installations of this kind. The Coral Reef, made in 2000 and now in the Tate Collection, was a landmark work that eventually prompted his place on the shortlist of the 2001 Turner Prize. And a closely related piece, The Deliverance and the Patience, gave him a huge international presence when it was shown to great acclaim at the Venice Biennale in the same year. The Deliverance and the Patience has been reconstructed for Mike's exhibition at the Hayward Gallery in London in 2023, and it's a spell binding warren of rooms. In one is a wooden platform with cut strips of fabric and scraps of paper with impenetrable calculations written on them. Another has a bare camp bed and ruffled sleeping bags. A kicked over plastic chair in another space suggests that a roulette game has ended abruptly and perhaps violently. There's a ship's captain's drinking den with signs saying please do not spit. A carpeted prayer room with a cabba in Mecca on a calendar on the wall. The rooms smell too of must and stale sweat. It's unpopular but signs of recent inhabitancy are everywhere. Cigarette ends, leather jackets hung over stools. It's like walking through a novel, each room a chapter, deepening the intrigue, only we enter into a kind of collaboration with Nelson to sketch out the protagonists. In another series of works, Mike names his fictional characters, the Amnesiacs, a biker gang of Gulf War veterans, as the co-creators of anthropomorphic and zoomorphic sculptures set within a wire cage. Their sculptures allude to a mythology. A motorbike is made of tyres, a wooden box for the body, a pair of walking sticks for the suspension, and animal horns for handlebars. It's like a ritual object for a fringe, lost, and perhaps traumatised collective. There's a perennial sense of dislocation and displacement in his work, whether it's the amnesiacs or others, whoever was here was on the move or searching for something. One piece includes a found VHS tape featuring a deranged lecture by a conspiracy theorist and hints abound elsewhere as to the historic and present economic circumstances that prompted the movement of goods and people. Mike also alludes to and reimagined works by other artists. Part of the work Triple Bluff Canyon from 2004 includes a reconstruction of the late US post-minimalist artist Robert Smithson's partially buried woodshed. Only the earth with which Smithson covered a shed at Kent State University is replaced by Mike with sand and oil drums also feature in the piece, evoking the Iraq War that was at its height when the work was made. 
In one of his best works, The Asset Strippers, made for Tate Britain in 2019, Mike brilliantly evoked the history of 20th century British sculpture while unleashing the ghosts of another past. He filled the Duveen galleries with the machines of British post-war manufacturing, the remnants of industries decimated over recent decades. Looking at the repurposed looms and knitting machines, it was impossible not to imagine the people that operated them, yet in their combinations they remained mysterious and lyrical. Mike likened them to British kitchen sink dramas in their mixture of social realism and a sense of the absurd. When I met Mike at his London studio, he'd recently opened the Hayward show called Extinction Beckons, in which he'd rethought, reworked and deconstructed many of his previous projects, something he's done consistently over the years. I began our conversation by asking him how it felt to be making a retrospective show. Is it counterintuitive to the nature of his work or does it feel like a natural extension of his self referential practice. When it was first suggested, it felt counterintuitive and actually something I didn't really want to go to in a way. I didn't really want to go there. But um, I think as I thought about it more, it felt kind of quite in keeping with the work anyway, in many ways. I mean, if you think back to the previous work I made in the Hayward to the memory of H.P. Lovecraft, that work where we ripped the walls up as if a, a, a beast had eaten it and a homage from Borges to sort of uh, Lovecraft. I then took the walls of the Hayward Gallery to another sort of brutalist building down in Villa Arson and Nice and, uh, and just set up a great big table saw, mitered them and made them into sort of into plinths, which so the, the sort of sense of the absence of the unseen was sort of doubled or tripled even. So in many ways, this shows like that, but also it's, it carries on, you know, a, a constant sort of trope in the work, which is the studio apparatus and also kind of a probably calls upon the amnesiacs and the idea of the amnesiacs to help me sort of construct it. That's really interesting. I'm I'm interested in the amnesiacs as a kind of fictional creation of yours. And this quote that I read by you where you said that fiction had had proved a kind of liberation when you were first sort of out of art college and you wanted to find a route through, fiction helped you to kind of formulate your work somehow. Yeah, I think um, in the 80s, when you're young anyway, you don't have really much to talk about. Uh, to be quite honest, and trying to find a, a kind of voice with which to express yourself, I think it's quite difficult. And the prevalent voice then that was kind of forced upon you was that of kind of theory of French theory, uh, which we all dutifully read, well, so, some more than others. <laughs> kind of, uh, and, you know, obviously I, I had my dose, I suppose, of it, and some of which I found very interesting, some not so interesting, some just totally impenetrable. And I think it was uh, having left Reading, and then you're somehow out of an art school sort of environment that then you can sort of start to sort of navigate your own way and then into Chelsea which wasn't quite so sort of theory driven I don't think uh, or the climate wasn't and maybe that's just the, the times as well the early 90s there was uh, perhaps an opening up sort of a slight more looseness to the sort of like the regime of what something could be categorized as or sort of because it did feel in the 80s very much as if you as you started making something, somebody was already accusing you of doing something wrong, sort of in terms of uh, what the matter was, what the material was. And yet the work hadn't even left the studio, which always seemed absurd to me. So, yeah, I think um, I had periods of reading fiction through my life. Uh, I was a slow reader as a child. I was even kept down a year. I was on you know, I was on August birthday and kept down a year because my reading and writing was so slow. And I think there was a certain period, I think, of like on a French exchange of homesickness when I was a young teenager where suddenly sort of like reading became an escape or somewhere to go. So I had a period then of reading quite heavily in my early teens and then sort of lost it again and probably didn't really refine it until my 20s. And in my 20s then I started sort of you know, reading fiction. And in that fiction I found not only a lot of the theory that I'd read, but in fictional form, in the theoretical sort of text. But also I found sort of like the things that the theoretical text had sort of used as their sort of like reference point. And it was a great um, illustration to me that many of the people I saw around me, you know, going through art schools were trying to illustrate theory uh, as opposed to making something perhaps more raw and more sort of like, you know, felt that a theoretician would find interesting to sort of turn into theory as an example. So, I mean, the amnesiacs were very much a disclaimer structure in that having gone through this self criticizing, self-doubting, self-analyzing sort of structure of the 80s at art school and the early 90s. 
it was quite difficult to throw off those kind of shackles. So the amnesiacs were kind of a useful disclaimer structure through which I could then sort of make really dumb sculpture because I actually quite enjoyed making a really raw, dumb sculpture that somehow talked of base human emotion or situations which perhaps would have been laughed at were they not sort of like somehow framed by a conceptual or more philosophical structure that the amnesiacs perhaps alluded to be. And how much is that related to this notion of hybrid script which you developed in that sort of mid-90s period? Because it's quite a clear idea of three different elements to a certain degree. But also it seems to me that it's still there in the work, you know, even yes. now. Yeah. I mean, I think um, when I look back at that, the first Extinction Beckons catalogue, which was the first iteration, sort of, uh, I can see almost everything still in there, which I kind of, I mean, maybe a success or a failure, I'm not sure, but I think that uh, intensity of thought and time in your 20s, you know, I think it's not to be overlooked when I speak to students, I say, you know, that period, you know, the dexterity of the mind and the sort of like dexterity of the body with it, the speed of which you can move, there's a lot to be done. So, you know, I think actually I used it quite well in regard to the work anyway. But um, in terms of uh, the hybrid script, that was something which uh, came up in 19... 19- 93 or 4, I think. 94, probably. Yeah, with Taylor was the sort of first so-called hybrid script work made in Liverpool, right? Well, it was two works with tents, really. One was in the Transmission Gallery in in, uh, in Glasgow, Hmm. Martin Boyce. And the first show I did outside of Chelsea was with Martin. And then Simon Starling I'd met in New Contemporaries. And and they were running a transmission with Kirsty Ogg and Toby Webster and a bunch of people, Evil Rothschild. It was a real incredible group. Amazing group, yeah. And they kind of like brought me up to do a show up in Transmission Gallery. And um, I think that was the last of the lineage of more sort of didactic, sort of more politically sort of motivated works, which... I felt as though they were rather clever, but when I witnessed the audience looking at them, I felt as though they weren't following the sort of the journey that I hoped they, they would take. So um, that work, I changed the name of Transmission Gallery to Charity Shop, which rather f- luckily sort of like was the same number of letters with a gap in between charity and shop and had a banner made up. And so, because uh, it was sat on a corner, so it became a transmission on one side, Charity Shop. We advertised it in the local press under the charity section. Um, I then bought a temporary shelter that was being sort of like uh, made by a company called Monoflex that Oxfam were sending out to emergency situations. At that time, it was on the borders of Turkey and in Iraq. Unfortunately, yet again, I suspect they're being used mm. for the Kurdish region. And um, I constructed that in the gallery as, as if it were an object. I used rubble from a local building site to weigh it down because you had to weigh it down. And then I moved the office out the back into the main gallery. It had a bit of a kind of relational aesthetic thing, which was kind of quite a on vogue, I suppose, at the time. Sort <laughs> of a, And then a catalogue um, about plastic sheeting and its use in emergency situations was used as a catalogue, which I actually had taken on sale or return from Central Books while I was working in the warehouse back in uh, Hackney Wick. And, you know, I Kind of was quite pleased with this. Hypothetically, somehow you could then bypass the the middleman in terms of the junk and the clothes that you buy in a charity shop and go straight to the object that gets sent out. You know, you could hypothetically buy one and send it to an emergency situation of your choice. There was a sort of amoral sort of like aspect to it because there's something dark about that. Mm. I would take a cut on top of this to make it even more slightly dark and sort of like difficult kind of a, as an idea. And so all these ideas, of course, I sold none. And it was all hypothetical. But I witnessed the audience come in and look at this and they really didn't go anywhere with it. They just saw the object and didn't really take it to the, the, the thought process. I thought, they might and at the same time I made this work Taylor which was a, a far more sort of like a sculptural kind of object in many ways a, a raft made about all barrels and uh, an old pallet tops so which actually came from Central Books as well they were very <laughs> generous to my early career you said it was like your studio for you working at Central Books yes yeah. it was yes they were like a great bunch I mean from the top down from sort of Mark and Bill who ran it down to David Crystal the, the poet that the warehouse manager right. it was I think uh unimaginable in, in today's world somehow yeah. how this place functioned I mean until the late 80s it had been funded by the Soviet Union I think still by right. the, um, the, to some degree but maybe that's a myth I don't know but uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it, there's some truth to it they still had the kind of the old Marxist library in there yeah. uh, whatever so and on top of it was an old tent sort of like uh, on top of the the raft and the, the hybrid script this was an idea that I'd kind of come up with it. I'd make these kind of scripts take a reference to the place it was being built a reference to the political situation of the time and, a, and a, a literary or filmic kind of reference in this case it was Taylor the character kind of Charlton Heston's character in Planet of the Apes where he travels uh, I think it's 2000 millennia or something to end up back in the same place but doesn't realise it yeah. where his situation is far worse kind of a uh, 
and the political situation at the time was the RAF crises in, uh, in Haiti and Cuba. And it seemed very much that this was a nice analogy to their situation. Not a nice, a true yeah. analogy perhaps, where they might end up in some internment camp back on the US soil. And then the reference to uh, the building that was built in a, an old warehouse in Liverpool, which was the last bastion of the British slave trade, so an old Victorian warehouse overlooking the, the, the harbour there. And when it opened, I could have watched people looking at it and the way they sort of reacted to it. And this idea of this hybrid script and the idea of it being almost like a kind of catalyst, you know, through which the viewer can somehow make sense of an essence of it, but not fully understand it, but also come with their own kind of histories and their own sort of experiences, seem to work in a far richer way. And I, so I suppose if we're to go to kind of forking paths, this was kind of one of them. And I then pursued that trajectory. I mean, then I made a work with Agent Dixon, the Red Star Hotel, which was emulated sort of like Alphaville, you know, Goddard sort of mm. homage to the science fiction B movie mm. and the way I constructed it. I then went on to trading station Alpha CMA at Matt's, which would have been the first work where you actually walked within it rather than around it and so on and so forth. The rest until, is history. Until yeah. Coral Reef, you know, so, but. Yeah. In the Hayward Gallery show, you've reconstructed the deliverance and the patience. But to what extent is it a reconstruction in terms of how mimetic, if you like, is it to that installation in Venice? Of course, you've got the the initial difference, which is that you're not in a kind of disused industrial space yes. anymore. Well, that was in, a, a- in a way, that was the hardest thing to deal with in regard to, you know, why would you want to really do that? That was built at a certain point, at a certain time, in a certain architecture. You know, how do you bring that to uh, the Hayward Gallery in t- 2023? Uh, kind of, um, and, wh- and why would you ultimately? And, you know, when I first walked in there in, in regards to, I've got a, quite a good sense of scale and space. And I sort of said to uh, Ralph, you know, uh, Dillance of patients would fit in here pretty much. We had to lose one corridor running across the middle of it because obviously we had to leave 150 at each end for the health and safety. So we had to bring it in a bit. So in regard to sort of layout, it's pretty much exactly the same, even though I would say that we had no plans because I've got my drawings in the notebooks, but actually they were transferred into early computer drawings because of how Venice was at the time. They were very pedantic, probably wisely, uh, <laughs> about health and safety, sort of like in fire regs, etc. And um, Kieran, who worked with me years ago, an architect and builder, he drew them all up, but nobody seems to be able to find these drawings anymore. But I have my, my drawings in the notebooks. We had rough measurements. We also had all the old skirting and bits and bobs. So, in fact, with uh, David, who works with me, and David Jones and sort of Paul Carter, who built it with me originally, and Stuart and Ben, whatever, sort of, uh, we could have rebuilt it in a warehouse down in Argos. So it's pretty much as it was in regards to the interior. Uh, the only difference, I would say, was the missing corridor, but also I decided to build it as an object because how do you make it somehow look as if it has some sort of pertinence to where it once was. So I decided to build it almost as if it were like a huge barge or raft, almost as if it could have floated sort of from Venice or floated in time almost sort of uh, to this destination. And to do that, I had to build it out of all old timber. Originally, it had been built out of steel stud, which is like, mm. again, a fire egg thing again. So this time I reimagined it back in a, a slightly heavier gauge of reclaimed 4 by 2 uh, which gives us this a very strong presence as an object in the room. And originally it was built into a building with a mezzanine level where you walked up and you stood on the mezzanine to look over the top of a certain section of it. So because of the low ceiling height in there, that wasn't possible because on the mezzanine there was all the remnants of the stuff we didn't actually use within the exhibition. Um, so it was almost like this kind of storeroom of its construction. So within this one, I decided to sort of like just spread it across the top almost... I don't know if you've ever been to a salvage yard or a sort of yeah. like a builder's yard and you've got a load of containers, you're just going to like chuck as much stuff on the top as you can get. So kind of had that sort of aesthetic as well. So, But in regards to sort of Taylor, which I think is a quite nice lead into the question about the deliverance and the patience, my idea was to somehow bring ideas of other works into other works, shall we say. So the idea of the raft is actually within the sort of deliverance and the patience ultimately, even though you might not consciously recognize it, but somehow that kind of sense of a raft was there even though I didn't include that work I feel in many ways it kind of is there 
So it's basically, you can, with your work, go on to this unraveling kind of rabbit hole, which is wonderful, actually. It's kind of a, a marvellous kind of series of references, both to yourself and to other art and to fiction and so on. Yeah. But one of the things I know that you said is that you can't, of course, expect your audience to know all of those things. And you trust the audience to bring with them whatever they bring. Yeah, their own histories and their own rabbit holes, you know, ultimately. And I think, you know, and that's to be in, encouraged in many ways. But I just want to kind of coerce them, perhaps, to sort of think it around a certain territory, around a certain politic or sort of like a or fiction or whatever, but not to somehow lay it down. Because I mean, when you read a book, I mean, a lot of it came from that experience of reading books where you sit down and, uh, you know, when a book really works, then it, it takes you somewhere else. And it's not your experience of that novel isn't the same as the next person. Your head is going somewhere and it's kind of, you know, meshing with your life experience and sort of, uh, and those that you know. And I think that experience I found very rich in fiction. I thought, well, it would be a nice thing to co-opt in terms of to visual art in a way that, you know, perhaps dealt with that more kind of lumpen idea of sculpture, which had certainly fallen out of uh, fashion in the 1990s and perhaps kind of tied it in more with a uh, video or film, which was kind of had a huge prevalence then. Mm. So sort of, uh, I mean, I used to joke years ago that the coral reef and didn't the patients was a sort of a, a sculptural trap that made you physically look at things, even if it was just for the way out kind of ultimately. So. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who's the first artist whose work you loved? The first person that always comes straight to mind is Graham Sutherland. Uh, when I was at school, uh, my art teacher who, you know, he was fighting a battle a bit. It was a, you know, it was grammar school. So it was very academic. So art seemed to have a relatively low sort of like status in the school, I felt. But he was an excellent teacher. His knowledge of you know, really contemporary art wasn't great, but he had incredible knowledge of the artists that had really affected him, perhaps, and he'd grown up with and were contemporaries, perhaps potential contemporaries of his, like, you know, Bacon, Sutherland, you know, John Piper. Mm. And I think all these kind of British sort of artists of a certain era were incredibly influential upon me. But it was Graham Sutherland that kind of intrigued me almost the most, not the cathedral kind of crucifixion type stuff, but the more sort of gnarly drawings of roots and twigs from the west of Wales, where they're... They're figurative, but abstracted at the same time. There was that sort of balance between that I found you know, compelling, but also you know, strangely um, slightly mystic. When I was doing a, a work not long ago, I was curating a show of objects in this strange archive of modern conflict with the, the professor from Sussex, David Meller. Mm. And uh, amongst that collection, I don't quite know why, because it didn't have much to do with conflict, but there was all the, the gridded photographs, the 10 by 8s of Graham Sutherland that he would use for some of those paintings. And they were fantastic objects yeah. for me to see. I was kind of, uh, again, I was excited yet again. It was like uh, <laughs> it was like when you come face to face with something you'd loved years ago and the love was still there somehow. Oh, that's so, so nice. I mean, it's one of those sort of figures who... It's difficult now to imagine how vast his reputation was in his own lifetime. Yes. He was one of the leading artists in Britain, and I'm sure people at that time felt he would be a superstar forevermore. But he has somewhat fallen away in the way that Bacon perhaps hasn't. Yes, but Bacon had a stagecraft, you know. That's you know, a good way of it's it, yeah. um, you know, Bacon again was a huge influence on me as well when I was at, mm. at school, and he also kind of he carried on being relevant outside of you know a certain sort of epoch whereas i think in a way sort of like graham sutherland the quality of it perhaps didn't change but the relevance of it at a certain point you know did and i think with bacon there was a sort of such a, a driven singular vision that still kind of like spoke you know between eras mm. so i can't really knock bacon for that ultimately but at the same time you know to be honest in my time of being influenced by a, a, an artist and being, you know, the Sutherland was more uh, at a certain point. But actually, Bacon probably quite quite fast on his heels afterwards. Right. I remember doing a painting that, you know, certainly sort of owed a lot to sort of Bacon <laughs> when I was at, at school. So. Oh, that's great. And which historical artist do you turn to the most today? Historical or contemporary? Well, historical, I take to mean an artist that's no longer with us. So Smithson would be a historical artist. Because there's two questions, isn't there? And I find them quite difficult because if I was to sort of separate them, they contemporary but he's also historical be Paul Tech probably. You discovered him by chance didn't you this extraordinary thing that you kind of wore into your language yeah. even before you knew him which seems to be extraordinary. Yeah. It was it was um, in fact Rachel uh, my partner Rachel Lowe was doing a show in Rotterdam and I'd gone out to help her do this show which is normally the other way around but at this point I was 
we were doing shows going back and forth between sort of like each one and um, in the back room there was this sort of like um, kind of crumbling sort of chicken coop type construction that was full of things that looked like they'd just pretty much rotted and i was like oh and i found it quite compelling it was it was really um affecting but mm. it had a, a tangible effect upon me and so i thought oh, who is this person and then there was this catalogue of the, the wonderful world that almost was i think it was called in fact it's behind me there paul tex i'm flicking through the pictures of this catalogue and um you know sometimes you kind of come across people's work and they've sort of done something that you've done something like and you're a bit like oh shit <laughs> especially in the 90s when like you know that, that whole kind of climate of the kind of YBA where people were peddling out ideas and stuff which really had been done before a lot of it you know putting a new spin it was kind of hooked on classics really uh, <laughs> but I saw this stuff and I just thought my god you know I'm not alone somehow and you know he'd built this Tatlin Tower piece which you know a year before I'd made in W139 in Amsterdam this big Tatlin Tower piece out of the interior of a house of a, as a sort of sacrificial pyre come Tatlin Tower Mm. And then he'd built a raft, you know, somewhat like Taylor, but with a sort of sand castle of sort of like the Tower of Babel on the top. And it was just absolutely like I was elated to find this person. He's, he's it's better than being dismayed. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. You, you could, I guess, have been dismayed. You'd be yeah. like, oh God, someone got there first or something like that feeling. I love that you were elated. Yeah, no. And it was around that time that then I did the residency up in Berwick upon Tweed where, you know, I'd gone with this proposal to make, you know, the, the biker gang you know, based on Soviet science fiction, etc. And then, yeah, my close friend Erland Williamson, who I'd, I was making the sort of Tatlin Tower in a show with him in Amsterdam the year before, uh, fell off the mountain and died. So in many ways that sort of tapped into the whole, you know, somehow that with his death, but also the sort of like the tragic story really of uh, Paul Tech, because he died of, of AIDS, mm. an early uh, victim of AIDS sort of in his early mid fifties, I think mm. sort of like, uh, with very little recognition. I think the story goes, it was working on a checkout till not when he had literally died, but that's what he was yeah. doing yeah. to make a living kind of, uh, when he seemed somewhat forgotten in it, Again, my friend Erland, who, to me, who's such a great artist himself with such potential and to, to have gone somehow. So mm. that's why I use this sort of, um, in reference both to my thoughts of my friend Erland, but also my thoughts of as a homage in, in a way to Paul Tech. I use the, the chicken coop because I like this sort of sense of this, uh, structure, this building that was so full in so many ways because it occupied so much space and yet it was so empty and you could see you know right through it like a kind of a just like a skeleton so yes he stayed with me Paul Tech in so many ways because it was awkward and difficult it was very felt the work had a empathetic or a, an emotional sort of level to it which was sort of deeply unfashionable I think at the time especially in the way that he he did it I, I wanted to talk about Smithson there's obviously this very direct homage to Partially Buried Woodshed which is this extraordinary piece that he made at Kent State which had all sorts of political resonances at the time and so on that you've made and it's there in the Hayward now and what I love about the way that you've done it in the Hayward is that you've used that piece and fused it with other pieces to allude to connections between other forms, not just in your own work, but other references and so on. And it therefore places Smithson in a kind of lineage of where he's so current and yet so distant as well. You know, it's now 50 years since he died. So it's about that kind of amazing charge of Smithson, but there's also something about the memory of Smithson there. I mean, Smithson isn't an artist that I was particularly interested in, aesthetically, shall we say. It kind of came to me through Ballard, really, reading Ballard. Mm. And I think increasingly it became more and more important critically to me, so somehow in the thinking, and just the way it unleashes the imagination. I think that's ultimately kind of what you know, one really wants to try and do ultimately is to unleash the imagination of other people. And there's a generosity to that as, a, as opposed to just it being your own somehow. And I think Smithson did that for me. But latterly, I mean, I, do, I was always aware of it. I was always kind of looking at it, but never really quite getting it. And in, in a way, sort of like the partially buried woodshed, Triple Bluff Canyon work, it was a reaction perhaps to my not really getting it, but also sort of like a, a sense that perhaps, you know, when Nancy Holt spoke of it after his death, I th felt posthumously uh, politicized it because in a way you know if you read an account of Smithson when he went to make that work at Kent State he, he had a streaming cold he didn't really want to do it they kind of he was like, kind of forced to do it it kind it? of was it was a bit like oh god you know he said oh you've got this old shack on the campus I'll just bury that and see what happens when it falls down and and then of course you know the Kent State shooting happened the four you know, where the Neil Young song comes from Four Dead in Ohio which curiously enough is where the title of mine Triple Bluff Canyon comes from so emulated like Cripple Creek Canyon which is 
a song on the same album, sort mm. of like uh, to make the title, to sort of bring that sort of Neil Youngish reference in. Oh, nice. And to somehow uh, repoliticize it, sort of like, you know, during the Iraq War in 2003 when I built it in, in Oxford. So, and I think I've described it before, almost like a mirror displacement. So, you know, by Smiths and where, somewhere between these two walls, it's kind of reflected, you know, two walls and two works. One work sort of uh, anticipating a, a situation and another one consciously sort of reflecting upon it, you know, uh, in terms of the old drums and the, sort of, and the yeah. desert sort of a... Uh, Whereas now the reimagining of it perhaps has, has environmental aspects to it, which is kind of curious really, because when I was at Reading... Years ago, a lot of the work I made in my second and third year was all around environmental concerns, ultimately. Yeah, but that definitely feels like the most tangible evidence of extinction beckoning, if you like, yeah. in the Hayward show. With this new work, M25, where you've salvaged those blown out, tire, tires, blown out yeah. tires from the side of the road. And I think if you are on the motorway and you see those tires and you think too hard about them, they are a terrifying prospect, you know? We don't, like everything, you know? It just sounds to me we go through life not thinking about the fact we're going to die every day, <laughs> sort of like, but we don't. You know, well, some people do, but uh, most people don't. So it's something about humanity, ultimately, sort of. Um, but yeah, the tyre piece really was, that was back in the late 90s as well, when, when I was in the residency in Barrett making the work with the amnesiacs. I was driving back up and down the A1 constantly, mainly between Newcastle and Berwick, where Rachel's parents were. And I'd look at these sort of blown out tyres and think, they're just such great objects. I mean, they're such great alchemy, untouched by humanity, but completely touched by humanity because the whole history of their extraction in terms of their raw materials, the technology, the science that's gone into the making of them, and then the sort of shodding of this strange steel thing that we kind of you know, drive around in. And then for this one moment where they... The tire blows, and of course, the existential dread of that kind of uh, you somehow have got everything's in there somehow, sort of yeah. like a you know, colonial empirical kind of history is sort of environmental disaster, sort of like uh, existential human dread. And in a way, that's why I don't like to do too much to them with all the incarnations of this work. The first one was in Birmingham with M6, where we just cast a great big concrete slab, which I then spent four days shot blasting to give it this perfect powdered finish to the concrete they just sat in these kind of sculptural configurations on the a7 in the leon biennale where i kind of uh, made these uh, rebar steel cages with concrete tops cast into them and then uh, a kind of eva hess like one i made in uh, dusseldorf in uh, the a58 where they were like hung and strung together rather like the one over there hanging from the ceiling so yeah we're looking at a blown out tire hanging from a kind of crude hook yeah that yeah. was just the first test i just made one test and then i thought well that works and that was it it really does then I, went, then I went off and just did the rest of them so and this one in the sand so and in a way the sort of um curiously that the idea to put the the tires in the sand came to me exactly this week last year uh when i was with two good friends uh Richard, Richard Grayson, and Cece Triester down in the, in the, in the Pyrenees. And we were like, it was a terrible wet day. So uh, we couldn't really go on a long walk in the mountains. So we ended up in a, a town called Tortoville, I think it's called. And um, it, it was absolutely deserted and empty. And the rain was lashing around, the mountains were around. And we came across this, well, we were taken to, because Richard knew exactly where we were going. This sort of brutalist concrete museum in the middle of nowhere, it felt like on the edge of the town. And inside, it was a sort of a museum to mark the finding of one of the first kind of hominids in Europe. Sort of, a, and you know these vistas, these archaeological digs, these sort of vitrines with sort of like sandy earth with bones in. And uh, and it was only us in there wandering around. It felt like the end of time. You know, if the kind of the the scene at the end of the road, but you find yourself instead in the in in a museum to the first hominid. It just seemed kind of perfect somehow. And I thought, well, maybe I can a sense of this in the hay would be kind of nice. You know, sort of a uh, but uh, all kind of pertinent should I say, rather than nice. Uh, so the bones became tyres, you know, right. sort of artefacts of our modern era, I suppose. I wanted to explore one very distant art historical reference, which I love, which is that, that Dürer's St. Jerome yeah. is an influence on this wonderful piece of yours, which is a kind of reconstruction of the studio you had made in your front room in South London way back. Yes. Tell me about that connection. Well, originally I made a version of it for a British Council touring show. So I rebuilt the desk that's in my front room. We're going back, you know, 20, 30 years now, this front room, I think. Yeah, this is from the 90s up until mm. 2003. And so this was a work that was bought by the British Council and was, was in a touring show around South America back in the early 2000s. But 
When I came to make the show in Triple Bluff Canyon with the woodshed, but also with, there was an octagonal cinema reception. This was at Modern Art Oxford. At Modern Art Oxford yeah, back yeah. in 2003. I was also, um, I was moving house. And I was very emotional about moving house because I'd been in this house for like 12 years, which is longer than I'd ever been in any house in my life. And, uh, and it'd been owned by a fantastic doctor, Dr. Hakim, who lived in Dakar in Bangladesh. And he, he trained and grown up in London in St. Thomas's. And so did his wife. They were both doctors. But his wife wanted to go back to have kids in, back in Bangladesh. So they left the, the NHS, but they kept the house on and they rented it out. But they, they just allowed us to live in it and pay the rent whenever we wanted within the year. And the rent was so cheap that it didn't go up for like 10 years. It was like six Japan a month, you know, in, between the commons, because I, I moved there to go to Chelsea because it's the closest place you could get to. You know, it was cheap enough back in the early 90s, you know, 1992. And he'd turn up every year for two weeks and stay in a hotel down the road. And I'd ferry him back and forth and we'd have barbecues. And he'd tell us the history of the British Labour Party and sort of like a, <laughs> a, a lovely man. But I always felt of him as a, sort of like a, it was kind of a patron of sorts because he kept the rent so low. And because of the way he's living as an artist, he'd, the money had come in in lumps and mm, cool. whatever sort of. Uh, so, you know, as long as it was paid by the end of the year, when he turned up, that was fine. So, which actually really suited. Mm. And in a way, I think a lot of that really allowed me to do what I did and live so cheaply. And, and so, yeah, the house had a very big part in my heart in a way. And that room in particular, because that had become my kind of studio, it was kind of all rammed into this small space. So when I came to leave, I thought it seemed like an interesting thing to had because I, I had already built a version of it as, a, as an artwork. I thought, well, I'll just rebuild the whole thing as a work for the, the show Modern Art Oxford. So in a way, as you look at it now, that is just as I left it back in 2003. And it's always a very strange experience to step back inside, which not many people would have the opportunity to do to go back in time ultimately to your old space but yes but the, one of the original kind of reference points of that was i mean it's always been a sort of like a trope of the artist from Dura's time onwards the idea of the artist studio the imagery the symbolism sort of like the um hourglass and this one is so packed with symbols and imagery and in a way if if you don't like one you'll like another one and one negates another and within that show you know i utilized a sort of like a found video which is like an object from the studio, which yeah. is something just picked up in a sort of flea market in San Francisco, sort of a kind of odious kind of man who's a sort of conspiracy theorist from the, from the early 90s, I think the video from 92. But I think it was, for me, it was interesting as well to re-show that because of the, the status of it from then to now. It's so unbelievably prescient. Oh, God, <laughs> you, know, you know, not only is this stuff prescient, but actually the man actually giving the lecture, the fact it was a slide lecture I kind of liked because it somehow had that kind of riff on the Smiths and sort of like Hotel Palenque as well, but, but somehow it was that sort of sense of where almost the conspiratorial, the kind of the leaps of the imagination are made just to pull everything into one honed down hideous sort of vision. Whereas Smithson giving his slide lecture was opening everything out, you know, and allowing you to come in and take things away and go off at all sorts of different sort mm. of, uh, and I think that difference and what the internet has done to this sort of material in this period of time, but also the, the fact that it's not only sort of like all around us, but actually the guy speaking, let's face it, has a very strong sort of um, similarity to some of the world leaders we've seen in the last uh, two decades. So yeah. I kind of thought, you know, actually this is an important thing to put in, to say I was talking about this then, but look at what this was then. This was an object that you couldn't access back in pretty much right. in 2002. Because it was a VHS tape. Yeah, you had to yeah. write off sort of like some PO box and you'd have to be some sort of crank to even bother to. So, and then you'd somehow, that would be it. And then you'd watch it on your VHS player. And now this stuff is just like a wash on the internet and, and people are, are watching it and believing it. It's insane. If it wasn't so dark, it'd be laughable. Brushwith is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to more than 170 cultural organisations through a single download, with new guides being added regularly. Among the most recent additions to the app are distinctive museums in different parts of the US, the Mingay Museum in San Diego, the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis and the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. A host of organisations with guides on Bloomberg Connects have shown works by Mike Nelson, from the Hayward Gallery in London to Tate in London, Liverpool and St Ives and the High Line in New York. Download the app and seek out the guide to the High Line and you can find out more about the former elevated freight railway line that has become a park and sculpture trail. There's information about current works, the High Line's garden zones and access to the full archive of art projects since 2012. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download 
download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're sitting in your studio. You you haven't had a studio until very recently, had you? And I can see, obviously, you've got elements which might comprise elements of your work here. But do you have things around you from other sources that you have pinned up that are kind of reference points? Not really. <laughs> I mean, it's all a reference point in a way. The studio, having just said that I don't have a studio, obviously I did have the front room in Balham. You wouldn't really call it a studio. It was just like an office. Yeah. In a way, this is pretty much the same. And in a way, there is a sort of sense that one could reconstruct this and it could become a work ultimately. And I think in terms of it being pinned up, it's, you know, it's not like I'm putting postcards up of artists that I like or no. whatever. It's more of the ambience of a space ultimately. And I think when I was looking for a studio, obviously, I mean, I'd love to have a huge, great white space where I can build big things. But I mean, <laughs> A, I can't afford it. And B, I don't want the lifestyle that I'd have to have to afford it ultimately. <laughs> right. So I started looking for something that could act as a sort of like somewhere I could play and make small experiments, but also more just like an office, but somewhere I felt was a good space to think. And, you know, I live quite nearby. I mean, we're in Crystal Palace and an old friend of mine who I knew from the, the markets and car boot sales back in the 90s. And then when I moved up around this way, you know, became a friend, Andy, Andy Stem, who, who owns the, the junk shop a few doors down this shop came up nearby to him so it seemed like a perfect place in a way sort of a uh, it kind of felt as if I was there's a few other junk shops there were then anyway it's changing a bit now but uh so I felt as if I was amongst friends somehow and you know I can wander into his space and look at his array of matter and it's constantly changing and I like that and we can stand around and uh, look at these things and objects I mean if we go back to kind of a we're on to literary references here, but roadside picnics to Stalker. And it is a bit like it's full of these strange objects that you don't quite know from whence they came. And one has to think about the histories of these things and what they were and why they were. And then see them in juxtaposition uh, from one to another, which again is incredibly interesting. I think, you know, sculpturally, not even sculpturally, just interesting per se, you know, in full stop sort of. Uh, so I enjoy that. Sort of, uh, I often say to my children, you know, you really must spend some more time in there because the nature of that type of shop, I think, is disappearing. Mm. Uh, the self-consciousness around material, you know, within other sort of like shops of that type, you know, you won't find within that. So it's a, it's a language that I think is being depleted somehow. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? I'd say over the years, probably the British Museum, ultimately. And I think you know, in regard to when I was making the asset strippers, that was probably that and the, the cast room, the V&A were the two reference points. When I was, at, you know, on the dole back in the 90s, which I often was, you know, those days when you really want to get on and do something, but you've got no money and you've got no space to do it in. So you'd wander off and I think in those days with the UB40, you could get in for free or at least a sort of more cheaply. I mean, obviously it's free now since the Labour government sort of yeah. 97, but before that, you know, you had to pay. Yeah, sort the of like, uh, charged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard, so, you know, I'd go in and uh, spend a lot of time, you know, in, in the V&A or the British Museum. In a way, that's more my reference point than, say, the National Gallery or National Portrait. I mean, or even, even contemporary. I think I've always had a sort of, I'm compelled to look at more, objects perhaps more an archaeological kind of heritage than an, an artistic one and your work's so alive to those sort of political colonial geopolitical histories yeah it I seems would. to me that, that you've mined that element of those spaces as much as you have the kind of anthropological or, or archaeological yes. yeah what, what material that actually means i think uh you know growing up in the latter half of the 20th century sort of you know, in industrial areas of Britain, you can't help but kind of somehow look at them in that way. But also, I mean, I think my mum forced my dad to take up a hobby because he was just sort of like so immersed in the often banal world of the factories in the Midlands. And he joined an archaeological club when I was a small child. And they used to take uh, us off with them to the, often with a lot of old men and women in a, in a bus around all these kind of long barrows and, you know, all the standing stones and around Britain. And that was incredibly informative. I mean, I found that incredible. You know, and looking for sort of fossils and objects of, of interest. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? Uh, travel, you yeah, know, if you can call it cultural. But yeah. uh, I think in those days, I think it kind of was cultural. It wasn't just um, holidays. I think, you know, I caught the very end of that kind of hippie idea of travel where there was a perhaps a slightly misguided, but I, I'm pleased it was in a way, idea that you travelled 
to educate, to meet different peoples, sort of like to see a world that you didn't grow up in, sort of like and understand how other people live, etc. As a child, I'd been on a French exchange, well, a few times, but that was really the only foreign travel I'd ever done. So when I was at the end of my first year, I went to meet um, my old girlfriend, uh, Nikki, in Athens, and then we travelled across to Istanbul and then to the borders of Iran and in the east of Turkey. And uh, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was an incredible experience. When I was living it, I was kind of ill and lost my passport and my money. And you know, it's a disaster, really. Sort of like, but if you want to sort of ramp up the existential angst, I suppose it did. And, and I think it also made me aware as well that in terms of perception, that different people have a very different perception. To some people, it was an adventure. Hmm holiday but to me it actually felt like like a trip you know like an existential it really was like a out of body at times you know i'd grown up on meat and two veg you know even the smell of a pepper it was a it was a it was an alien smell sort of like a, <laughs> so to find yourself in a, a place like you know, turkey at the time and it's interesting i was thinking about it recently i'm not too sure you can fully equate it to sort of like a an othering of a culture either which, of course, there is that aspect. Yeah. I mean, historically, being British, that exoticism, that sort of like mm. is very strong. Sort of built into that whole idea, even if it's an innocent enterprise traveling from a sort of former colonial yeah, uh, right. power. Is, I was yeah. talking with a friend recently who's been living in Istanbul and the extreme political situation in Turkey mm. at the moment and uh, Erdogan. And I was reminding myself of the political extreme of the time in the mid 80s when I was there the first time. And I think that sense of not quite knowing what was going on, I think very much equates to perhaps an ideology as well. Because in a way, it reminded me very much of being in Prague or East Berlin in the 80s before the end of the Soviet Union. And that's sort of like, again, you're not quite sure what's going on. I mean, recently on a trip to Moscow building a show, like a few years ago, I had to install a work in Moscow. And again, I had that same sort of sense, that same sort of like, I don't quite know what's going on here. Yeah. I don't feel quite comfortable. There's something untoward. You know, and I think the sense is the way they're sort of manipulated by these experiences sort of like it is quite strong. And I think different people are, are more attuned perhaps to certain things than others. And I think it was it was overwhelming for me that first trip. But Can also, you draw a line from that experience directly to things like I Imposter, which obviously... Oh yeah. 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 I mean, five years later, I went back and did the whole trip again, all around of East Turkey again, but this time into Syria, hmm. you know, a bit older, a bit wiser, sort of like and a bit more worldly. And I think... Uh, just to see the shift again as well within a certain place, the shift of Turkey at that time from what I'd seen in 87 to what I saw then in 92, the modernization, which actually there was a positivity around the country at that point. And even when I did the, the Istanbul Biennale in 2003, you know, it really was opening up. It seemed, you know, from my perspective for the people, I mean, I might have a certain perspective, obviously, it mm. seemed like a, in, a, in a good place, but obviously latterly it's, it's not. Which writers or poets do you return to the most? Obviously, Stanislav Lem hmm. and Stugatsky Brothers, and Borges, Richard Broutigan. They haven't really changed a great deal from my 20s and 30s. They've stayed, the odd one gets added, but it's pretty much... There was a certain period where there was an intensity of reading that was so so strong. Uh, it formed you know everything in terms of what I... Yeah. Do. And you've really used those literary yes. sources in very different ways, haven't you? I mean, in, in the one sense, there's Trading Station Alpha, where you're literally making a piece which is about both the literary source and then the filmic, filmic source, result. Yes, yeah. So there's two sources. So you're conflating all sorts and, of course, making art from it. Yeah. I mean, it's curious because, you know, I still read really slowly. And so there's always that sort of sense that you really want to read the right book. You know, it's not like my oldest daughter can read a book in like two or three hours. <laughs> I can't understand how on earth you can do that. Sort of like, uh, but I remember Jackie Irvine was like that years ago, you know, I mean, she was incredible, you know, sort of like she's so mm. sharp, you know, both in regard to theory, but also fiction, but also kind of visual art. So, I mean, she was a great uh, educator for me, sort of, uh, and she wrote all the first essays in the first yeah. catalogue, the first Extinction Beckons. So, I mean, in fact, she, I mean, I must give her a shout out for that, that she is the person that said, why don't you use that as the title, Extinction Beckons, for the first catalogue back in 2000. Because oh. it was, you know, it came from a sticker on a motorbike helmet within 
Master of Reality, the first Amnesiac show. So often when people ask me whether, you know, it's a bit doom mongery, I'm kind of like, yeah, but it's, it's actually just a sticker on a motorbike helmet. Yeah. It's like this sort of dark humor from the 70s. And I think, again, we go back to Sugatsky Brothers and Roadside Picnic, the idea that there's a visitation, and these objects that came from the visitation that the scientists are looking at, trying to work out what these people from outside our world sort of like are trying to communicate to us. It actually, they're not. It's, it's just the detritus from a roadside picnic. They just stopped and they, yeah. they they left their apple cores and sort of like uh, bits of waste food and they changed the spark plug and we're looking at them thinking they mean something. but And they do. Of course, they're utterly meaningful, but they're utterly meaningless. And I think that in a way, the title is that as well. But it's sort of wink to your audience to a certain degree, isn't it? So yes, we can carry with us so much and we can read so much into what we're seeing in your work. But at the same time, yes, they might actually just be extremely interesting, but ultimately useless objects arranged in space. Yeah, well, I think the first incarnation of that was the educational exhibition for dogs in 96 I made in Bucharest, where it was like a sort of a room just strewn with rubbish. Where, but amongst it, I'd made out of the rubbish 40 different tableau and objects about why we're human and their dogs. And obviously it was an absurdity because you know, it was all on a low level so dogs can sniff around and look at it sort of make sense of it but you know yeah. I mean, the material was as interesting as the tableau and in a way when you look at the asset strippers that's what that is it like constantly you know, becomes monumental sculpture becomes like something from the the lower halls of the British Museum but then at certain moments it just becomes piles of stuff the matter it's made from and I like that with all art where it's on that edge on that line between being something and nothing all at once absolutely but it's also a means of calling attention to the fact that you are a sculptor and this is one of these curious things that you read the literature about you it's perhaps I think positively from your point of view people don't know quite where to place you they will talk about you in the context of installation they will talk about you in the context of sculpture but it seems to me that in between those spaces is a really rich fertile environment to be you know? well yeah for certain I, I think I said um, the other day somebody asked me something in the press release in regard to that and I referred back to this um, review of a, a retrospective of Ed Keynotes after he died and uh, I think the first line was I don't know what it is Ed Keynotes really does. I'm not even sure if it's even art, but whatever it is, it's kind of interesting. And I thought as an epitaph, that was like kind of what <laughs> I would like. I don't even care if people don't think it's art. You know, I don't, I just quite enjoy doing it, you know, and making it sort of, uh, and trying to make sense of the life I've lived in the world that I've seen. And I don't really care so much for the categorizations. I always thought it was strange when, you know, it's uh, meant to be for the Venice Biennale, for the pavilion, and they said the first installation artist or something. I was like, really? <laughs> uh, you know, just why th this need to kind of categorize kind of uh, constantly. Yeah. Like, I found very odd. But I don't really care. I, don't, I mean, I still don't quite know what that term actually means. But sculpture is, has a more of a longer lineage and history, and I kind of, if it, that's about matter and material, then yeah, I... I am. Mm. But also, I went to college to be a painter. So. Yeah, that's nice. Like Graham Sutherland. Yeah, and like Philip de Barlow, for instance. So there's yes, so, there's, um, it is fascinating how that happens, that shift that can happen. Going back to literary sources, one of the things I'm interested in is the different ways in which you will pull on literature. So, you, for instance, with Stanislav Lem, it's all sorts of different elements. Like, for instance, you use this idea of kind of predicting your own kind of future sculptural production with a future object tick. Yes. But then at the same time, with Ballard, it's like you're going through Smithson to get to Ballard or perhaps the other way. Yeah. And then there's Kerouac and it's about the kind of notion of him writing on a continuous sheet of paper. So you will access it, both the culture of literature and the kind of actual literary source itself. Yeah, I mean, I haven't really analysed it myself. I just sort of do it, I suppose. But, you know, a perfect vacuum became the coral reef. The idea of Lovecraft is more through Borghese and it's Borghese emulating Lovecraft. Sort right. of... Um, and then me emulating Borges. In terms of a more a definition of sculpture, the yeah, roadside picnic, the Stugatsky brothers, as, as I spoke about before, uh, the amnesiacs. I mean, my first um, interest in them was uh, was an essay about um, uh, social conflict. I think it, the book was about. Again, mm. it came from the warehouse in Central Books, <laughs> and. It was an essay about uh, Soviet science fiction writers and their bypassing of the censors to talk about the humanity and the human condition in their country. And I emulated that really as the proposal for the amnesiacs. And because it was going up to Berwick upon Tweed, I decided I'd dumb it down both to the sort of biker genre of the early 70s rather than science fiction, which was something very akin to where I grew up in the villages in the East Midlands. Right. But also I could have turned the cosmonauts from Solaris into, into bikers and I could use the North Sea as the sentient ocean, sort of like uh, rather than the ocean of Solaris. And then 
I could go beachcombing, which you know, I remember somebody telling me years ago that all art students should be kept away from a beach, sort of like uh, and making art out of things off the beach. So I thought, well, that's what I'll do. I'll go to the beach and I'll make stuff off the beach, you know, which uh, we all want to do, let's face it. It's a real pleasure. And I think, <laughs> actually, I think, Sometimes it's trying to find that excuse to do actually what you enjoy. And uh, I think I've been doing that, even though it is curious in in terms of making objects. I think years ago, part of the environments were I had to build the environment to make an object. And often I would have liked to have spent a bit longer in those environments and carried on making objects within (laughs) them. So... I ask about other media at this point. I think it's key that we talk about film. And we've already talked about film in terms of Goddard, for instance. But again, in terms of the sort of interweaving references, film, it seems to me, is almost always connected to literature in your work. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's the, you know, growing up in the 70s in in Britain, I mean, that's the way that a lot of literature sort of was accessed, you know, whether it's kind of, uh, you know, religious epics or kind of um, later on sort of like modernist cinema from... France and Italy, it was, and film was very much part of the language of art school, I think, in the 80s and 90s, which I don't notice so much these days because film was a distinct, almost theoretical sort of uh, territory in itself, which Mm. I feel as though it's partly become entertainment now, which a lot of filmmakers might hang me for, but (laughs) I don't think it's the problem of the filmmakers, it's more the kind of climate that we exist within. Certainly the discourse around film was it was really informing so many of the artists and students I was with back at that time. Yeah. And, um, you know, we think nothing of spending, you know, six hours on a sort of like triple bill of sort of Goddard or Tarkovsky kind of, uh, yeah. which, you know, is, was pretty hardcore. But it was kind of, again, those days on the doll sort of years ago where I'd often go up to Hampstead to the Everyman where they'd have a triple bill where you could get in for sort of like three pound and get six hours of films, you know, which you know, it's pretty heavy duty, but it was... <laughs> An education, shall we say. And um, Tarkovsky I always had problems with years ago because I found it too subjective and I enjoyed the more the more trashy aspect of the literature that it referenced. Like, it wasn't trashy at all, but the idea of a sort of lo-fi, sort of sci-fi, and it was more objective, it felt. It was more kind of talking about a specific situation. And so I always struggled a bit with Tarkovsky years ago, but, it, you know, ultimately... As time goes on, I'm more and more appreciative of Tarkovsky. Mm. But having said that, the filmmaker that I really enjoyed at that time, which I think it probably tells you a lot, is Peraginov, sort mm. of, um, who was a friend of Tarkovsky and was was jailed for his yeah. his films because of their reference to the idea of an ancestry in in um, Soviet states that kind of like you know, actually weren't Russian. And what I liked about his films was that there was no kind of linear narrative. I mean, it wasn't in Tarkovsky. This was different in that it was almost like a, a series of tableaus. Yeah. And you'd just have one tableau after another, and it would kind of wash over you somehow. And you'd get a semblance of an understanding of something, but you were never really quite sure exactly what it was. It really would kind of absorb you. And like that same experience you were talking about, travel, almost out-of-body experience. It was out-of-body, yes. And I thought it was interesting as well because he was Georgian as opposed to sort of like Russian. It was right on that cusp of, of the Soviet Union and Asia. Yeah. You know, it was part of Asia that was... Because he's Georgian-Armenian as well. So Georgian, a, yeah. Yes, exactly. Sort of like so, it's really... Yeah. You know, and I'd been on the borders of these countries in eastern Turkey, and which is the most incredible, beautiful Mm. landscape you know kind of i remember being there and this sort of sense of the, an expanse of asia that's sort of beyond that i didn't know quite yeah. what was there and i think i've always been having grown up during the soviet union that sort of sense of how you know, the soviet union somehow was a like, like a stopper in the bottle that buffer between us and asia somehow and the east somehow it went from germany to you know mongolia or mm. the kind of this shift into a kind of a a different world somehow, sort of like uh, didn't really happen. It just was yeah. disappeared. And I think when the Soviet Union fell, it was kind of, it made huge changes ultimately. But With Parajanov, with the Stugatsky brothers, with Tarkovsky, with Stanislav Lem, it seems to me that it really taps into your work from the perspective of a kind of that thing that we were talking about earlier on with, with the idea of a political perspective from the one hand, but a fictional perspective on the other. And that sort of mingling in your work of those two things. Yes. 
It speaks to that sort of condition in certain ways, even if the actual language is very different. Yes. I mean, when the actual language, I think, again, is informed, though, by something like Parajanov and mm. perhaps goes back to like, when Lovecraft writes on the uh, supernatural literature and he talks about a semblance of atmospheres. I mean, going back to film experiences as, as a child, I remember watching um, Mask of the Red Death, the Roger Corman film, mm -hmm. which... I found absolutely, if you, if you see that, you can see then the influence on me in that, you know, when they move from room to room with a different sort of like, it starts off as your standard sort of hammerish type horror film somehow and just goes into something completely outside of that. I mean, it was, you know, visionary sort of, uh, somehow. So, you know, even films like that were incredibly sort of like influential on me. Um, you know, obviously Goddard, I mean, mentioned Alphaville. I mean, the kind of the cleverness to sort of like to emulate sort of the B movie of, Again, it's science fiction B movie, but somehow film it sort of uh, in contemporary Paris, but in such a way that it looks like a futuristic sort of place to take kind of actors and characters out of other books and out of other sort of films. Let me caution or Agent mm. Dixon, sort of like the Belgian sleuth from the 30s or let me caution it sort of, I mean, it's kind of tricks, which kind of Tarantino somehow has sort of like had been doing more recently, but actually done with more style in a way. So. Yeah. What music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? I tend to, I mean, years ago, I remember doing the 2004 Sao Paulo Biennale and, and I think at that point I started wearing some CD player with headphones because it was so noisy in there. So I'd just listen to whatever was, was on really sort of, uh, and then, you know, that changed to an, one of those old fashioned iPods, <laughs> which I just put on shuffle and whatever's in, in there kind of comes out and it's a mixture of, there's a lot of late sixties, you know, again, sort of, um, uh, David Crosby and sort of, uh, mm -hmm. garage psychedelia sort of from the same kind of era. Mm -hmm. But then there's, uh, yeah, you know, I've always loved the fall, mm. the stranglers, which I, I listened to when I was, uh, the first album I bought when I was 12 was No More Heroes. <laughs> So, oh, really? sort of, uh, I still listen to that kind of a, uh, you know, things like that. And recently I've been listening to a lot more Davy Graham. I picked up in a jumble cell years ago and I find him incredible sort of like guitar player. And also his, his history in terms of being from Liverpool, but with kind of Nigerian heritage and then traveling in the Middle East in the early sixties, picking up sort of like kind of guitar riffs and stuff in, in North Africa. And bringing them back, I mean, that sort of richness, but then the kind of dexterity of what he does is incredible. Michael Chapman, who died last year, mm. unfortunately. Yeah, I listen to all sorts really ultimately. Sometimes I wish I had more time, you know, to find out more things, but... <laughs> I mean, I know that the intensity when you're making works in space. Do you have music accompanying you when you're installing the shows as well? Uh, normally, I let the kind of people I'm working with, they choose. So, and curiously, sort of like uh, in, in Venice, I mean, you know, Ben and Stuart and David are playing all sorts of like techno and all sorts of like real like, you know, kind of music to work to, you know, to <laughs> make things fast. I'd have my headphones on with, you know, sort of like, you know, some old Crosby, Stills and Nash on or something or, or like a, you know, the Edgar Broughton band or some, something really sort of going back years. And I, so I'd sort of like let them get on with that and I'd sort of get into my own world. But strangely enough, this time, Ben, the musical tastes have become more like mine, so he must be getting older. Sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> he was playing a lot of MBS, sort of like, uh, is it NBC, MBS, or like the American public radio station? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they've got some quite good stations, so he'd, he'd put some of that, and it was kind of a lot more mellow, a lot more kind of, maybe a bit more, yeah, more like my taste, which is kind of, <laughs> well, it's like disturbing, sort of. Uh, <laughs> is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? No. None at all. When I'm building a big show, there's an anxiety around my tools, I'd say. That is the one where I don't like it if I haven't got my tools. I saw you as I came to see your Hayward show, sort yeah. of going through a mass of stuff to find very specific tools. And yeah, it, and yeah. if they go missing, I kind of find that really difficult. Mm. So and that's, that's probably a, an anxiety thing, ultimately, where, you know, these are the things that help you do it. Mm. And then and that pretty goes back to my childhood. My dad was also very... If he ever lost it with me when I was a small child, it would be because I'd left one of his hammers out in the in the grass, you know, sort of gone rusty. And then he'd, he'd have to sort of like emery paper it all back down and oil it. You know, so it probably goes back to that. That's really nice. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? I think there would be a fire in a cave with, you know, the paintings on, on the wall. Because in a way, if I was to sort of think about an artwork constantly, that would be it. Because that's the moment, isn't it, ultimately, when we understood that we're human and that we had a need to sort of somehow define ourselves 
or, or reflect upon ourselves about our own existence. So if I was to have an artwork, it would be in a cave with a fire, an old a cave painting somewhere down you know, near the Pyrenees in the south of France. And Because I think you both got the history of art, but also the history of film as well then, because obviously the flickering light on the paintings on the wall is the beginning of film as well. So that, that's the work I'd have, yeah. That's a lovely answer. And I get a cave as well. <laughs> of course, everybody wants a cave. <laughs> And lastly, what's art for? Well, I think that goes back to the fire in the way. It's something which defines us as human. There's a moment in Ridley Walker, you know, the um, Russell Hoban book, and it's the most fantastic bit where it's, this, it's written in this strange made-up language and it's this kind of post-apocalyptic sort of like grouping of peoples and they're somehow trying to articulate their existence somehow. And I think he's one character talking about how it wants to be able to pull the skin of somebody else on almost like it were a jumper or a piece of clothing and look through the the eye holes the punched in eye holes of that body and to see as if they were that person and for me if art is for anything any type of art film music literature it's to be able to see through the eyes of somebody else the closest thing we can get to seeing through the eyes of somebody else and in that lies kind of empathy and in that lies the best element of humanity in it I'm afraid to say, I think we're losing that uh, to some degree. <laughs> so yeah, that's why we do it, I think. That's why we, we value it. And that's why when I'm at uh, those moments where I kind of think, what the hell am I doing? What on earth is this? It's absolute rubbish. <laughs> then you have to go back and think, well, you know, and then you meet somebody, you know, a student you taught, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or somebody you saw a show you 20 years ago, and it had an effect upon them. And you think, well, that's something you've done. So, so carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do much else. Mike, thank you so much. And cheers. Mike Nelson, Extinction Beckons, is at the Hayward Gallery in London until the 7th of May. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Please also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter at Town Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producer is Amy Dawson. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and a big thank you to Mike Nelson. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.